that as of yesterday, we now have over 3,000 recipients of the, of the digital badge and universal design for teaching and learning, it's great, which is great. So we've just gone through another um, national rollout. So I'm just going to share my screen here. And hopefully you can see that okay. So um, as Michelle said, I work in UCD and I work in the area of access and inclusion for students. Um, just to give a little bit of context, and this is a lovely picture of UCD, which will be very familiar to my colleagues. UCD doesn't necessarily look like this every day, though, I should say. Um, so when we talk about student inclusion, I'm talking about um, students who maybe are traditionally underrepresented in higher education. So I'm talking about students with disabilities. I'm talking about students from socioeconomic the disadvantaged backgrounds, mature students, part-time students, students coming in through further education pathways, um, essentially communities that might have been traditionally distant from higher education. And UCD has a very diverse student population, which I don't think, um, we're probably not particularly good at getting that message out there that we do have a diverse student population. So a third of our undergraduate students in UCD are access students. Um, and another third of our students are international students. So we have a very diverse student population and that's reflected across, um, I suppose across the country and across the sector, both in further and higher education, we already have a very diverse student population. And sometimes when we talk about access and inclusion, wider participation and universal design, there's a sense that we're doing this to prepare for the day when we have um, a diverse uh, student population, but we already have um, a really diverse uh, cohort with us, which is great. So what is universal design? So um, as Michelle said, I do a lot of work around universal design and universal design for learning with colleagues um, across the whole sector, which is great. There's a real collaborative kind of community effort when it comes to um, inclusion um, in the sector in Ireland. So universal design at its most basic level is the creation of a product or service or an environment. So we could be talking about an educational environment, um, or a library, which can be accessed, understood, and used to the greatest extent possible by all people. So we're looking at a way to open everything up um, in a way that not only can people access, but they can actually use everything um, that you're providing, regardless of their age, their size, their ability, or their disability. So universal design started off in the realm of physical design. So if we have a look at examples of universal design in action, a really good one, and my favorite example of universal design is to say is the automatic door that's in everybody's local supermarket. So every time you go to Tesco's or John's, you go in through an automatic door, it opens as you approach it, and absolutely everybody can use the same entrance. So that's a good example of universal design. We're not having to allow some people in one door and other people have to go you know, another direction. It's not stepped access, it's level access, an automatic door. You don't have to push a button or turn a handle to get in. It's for absolutely everybody. Another one is the seatbelt that you have in your car, fully adjustable. So again, it doesn't matter what shape or size you are, you can put on your seatbelt um, and it will work for everybody because it's been designed for everybody. Um, and I have a picture of uh, UCD library there in the middle, because I do want to acknowledge all of the amazing work that my colleagues um, in UCD, Marta, Michelle, um, and everybody there have done in terms of resources they've developed, which have been universally designed, but also the physical space in the library, which is universally designed. So this is a, a picture, it's probably a little bit out of date now from um, this is the, the main level space where students can go and collaborate and talk. And the library as a whole has a lot of different types of spaces, which is really important. So depending on what a student's needs are, what they what their preferences are, and what's going to suit them in a learning environment, there's lots of different places that they can go. Um, and that's really important. And just, um, just this week, another initiative was launched where students could uh, can now get uh, noise cancelling headphones in the library. So they can borrow them when they're in the library, which is another great initiative in thinking about inclusion and making the space accessible um, and inclusive for everybody. So just a little reflection exercise, and don't worry, I'm not going to call on anyone, um, but I want everybody to think about universal design. And I like this reflection and it works well um, in an online session as well. So if you look at the space that you're in, so I'm actually in my own home, I'm working from home today, I'm in my sitting room. Um, what aspects of the space are universally designed? So thinking about the entire breadth of uh, human diversity, 
what aspects of the space that you're in are universally designed. If you'd like to um, put in the chat any aspects that are universally designed. For me here, um, it's a new build house. So all the doors meet uh, part end building regulations, meaning that if there was somebody who was using a wheelchair, they'd be able to access the building. The light switches are at a, an accessible height, so everybody could you know, turn those on and off. Um, in terms of aspects that maybe aren't universally designed, the furniture that I have, I think is probably not universally usable. Um, thinking again about the, you know, people of different heights, different sizes, different abilities. Um, so people could come in, but they wouldn't necessarily be able to use the space in the way that others would use the space. And I think that's a it's a good way for us to think about universal design. So thinking about a physical space, it's not enough to have the automatic door. You actually have to then look at well, what's actually inside that building and how can somebody navigate the building? How can they use the resources that you have there? If it's a kitchen, for example, what are the counter heights? Could somebody actually use that counter to prepare food? What height is the fridge at? What height is the cooker at? Um, and if we translate that then into information or education for students, so it's not enough for us to widen participation and open the door for a diverse student population. We actually have to think about what their entire experience is going to be like in that education or in that uh, information space. So can everybody access um, all of the information that you're providing? Can they access the resources? Can they use them? So if I am, for example, a student with a disability who uses a screen reader to access information, can I access all of the amazing resources that are available through my library? Sadly, the answer is usually no, um, because of issues with digital accessibility, not so much in the library itself, but in terms of the resources that are available. And certainly that's an issue that we've come across um, in UCD numerous times where we might have a student, usually a student who's blind or has a significant visual impairment, who needs to access materials for the curriculum or just wants to do additional research as well. That when it comes to a lot of the resources, the way they're produced through the, the publisher, through the journals, through the databases, is not necessarily accessible. So that's what we have to think about. Universal design is not just about getting people in and having them there. We need to make sure that everybody can access everything. So we'll talk a bit more about that. So in terms of accessibility and information, it's thinking about digital accessibility and full digital accessibility means that anybody who's using assistive technology can actually access that material. They can use their technology independently to read aloud a text, to parse through a text, so going through the headings, rather than just ending up with, unfortunately, what a lot of publishers produce is a flat PDF. So it might be essentially the same as something that's been scanned in and saved as an image. So there are technologies that we can provide to that student to essentially break into that text. Um, so to run OCR software on a piece of, uh, on a PDF, for example, it's possible. But every time we put in an additional step for a student, that's an additional barrier that we're putting there for somebody. So we're talking about accessibility. It shouldn't just be, is it technically possible to access this, but it's like, what's the ease of use for every individual when it actually comes to this information. So publisher practice is something that we have to, I suppose, continuously battle with in terms of how they're providing um, digital resources and whether open access is actually for all. If it's not digitally accessible, then it's definitely not. I mean, that's we can say that definitively. We have um, quite strong legislation in Ireland. So the Web Accessibility Directive means that everything that a public body provides digitally must be fully accessible. Um, however, because we are providing only, I suppose, access to the publisher's sites, the onus is on them and they're not covered as they're not a public body, but there is still through the Equal Status Act, um, we would argue that the, the need for digital accessibility is still enshrined there um, in legislation. So accessibility, I suppose, is one aspect of universal design and universal design for learning or UDL. And what we're aiming to do with universal design is to create that fully inclusive experience for every person so that we proactively remove barriers um, by offering flexibility. So most uh, learner var variability that we will come across will be what we'd consider hidden. 
so hidden diversity that you know you can't tell when you meet somebody if they have a particular need so there's a need for us to think about how we design our services then to be as inclusive as possible so we think about that diversity proactively rather than having to react and ultimately what we're trying to do is eliminate the need for somebody to have to put up their hand and ask for something different because what we've provided is not accessible to them so we should be aiming to provide something that everybody can access easily and I think that's a really important point um, without the need for any additional interventions or supports um, and you're probably all familiar with this, um, the cartoon that I have on the slide, which looks at the difference between equality and equity and justice. Um, I like this one because it also has inclusion tagged on to the end. So um, obviously we know in reality, lots of people have more resources than others and those who need them the most quite often are the ones who don't have them. Um, and the, the usual cartoon is that there's a barrier and people are standing at the barrier. We give everybody the same, which is one box to stand on. It's going to work for some and not others. So then we give people what they need and that's equity. But actually justice is removing that barrier altogether. Um, and inclusion means that you're not just standing on the sidelines watching other people play the game, but you're actually in the game yourself. So it's thinking about how we can move ourselves forward. Like it's a, it's um, sometimes it can seem overwhelming, and when you look at everything that needs to be done to to create something that's fully inclusive for every individual, but actually taking a what we consider the plus one approach to your practice um, can be really beneficial. And I'm going to leave you with a with a plus one in just a minute, um, but making small incremental positive steps we'll ultimately get to the place where everything is as inclusive as possible and always thinking about the end user um, when or the potential end user when we're designing a service or procuring a service so we're trying to move things on from the deficit model so in higher education the deficit model meant when a student came to university we thought about what are they missing what do we need to them to have in order to fit in with us in the institution and to fit in in higher education. So we're turning that around in the University for All Initiative in UCD and asking, well, actually, what's missing in the institution? What do we need to change about ourselves to make sure that we're inclusive of the student? And where are the barriers that we need to remove um, to make sure that they can access everything? So previously, we had a very, uh, I suppose, reactive approach, and we still do because it's necessary in some cases, and what we call differentiation which means we're putting up ladders. So the walls, are, the walls remain and we give students something to help them to get over the top of that wall and they move on to the next one. But universal design is more proactive and it's really about smashing down the wall in the first place. So the example I like to give would be if you have a student who has a financial need. So rather than putting in more scholarships or rather than only putting in more scholarships or more emergency financial support, we actually look at the institution and ask, where is the institution providing a financial burden for this student? Where are they putting up the barrier? What is the cost of food? What is the cost of transport? What is the cost of accommodation? What can we actually change to reduce the cost, not just for this one student, but for every student and eliminate the need for somebody again to put up their hand and say, I can't afford this, I need additional financial support. And we can, I suppose, mirror that across all the different diverse groups that, of students that we have. So there are multiple layers with this nice UDL pyramid, which I had developed back in 2017. And what we're trying to do is support every student on the bottom layer of the pyramid as much as possible. So universal design will give you something that works for most students. And as we then go up the layers, there'll be fewer and fewer students who need those individual interventions. And they might be things like assistive technologies, um, financial supports, <clears throat> individual exam accommodations, things like that. But that we should always be thinking of ways to, to have students be on that bottom layer of the pyramid so that we're providing for them as much as possible. So this is my plus one that I'm going to leave you with because while um, I suppose it's a big task in looking at what publishers provide in terms of content and accessibility, we all create content every single day in our jobs. No matter what you do, you create content, whether it's a presentation like this or a Word document, a report, maybe you're updating a website, anything like that. And these are things that you can do to make sure that your material is accessible for anybody who might access it. So use a sans serif font. So that means something like Calibri or Arial and not Times New Roman or anything that has additional, as I call them, little curly bits on it. And all that means is that your material is now more readable for everybody. 
Um, if you're producing slides, have a minimum font size of 24. If it's print, a minimum font size of 12. Avoid underlining and italics and block capitals because they interfere with readability, again, for everybody. When you have images, use alternative text. Um, and I'll show you a nice way to, to do that in a second. So on your images and tables and graphs, alternative text means that once you have a, um, if you're using a screen reader or any kind of read aloud software, it will read aloud what's there in the image for the person who is otherwise going to miss out on that content. And if it's just decorative, then you can tick a box to say it's just decorative and the screen reader will skip past it. Use good color contrast, left align your text rather than centered or justified. Use the heading styles embedded in the software that you're using. Again, somebody then can just click through the headings rather than having to listen to an entire document to get to the piece that they need. Use the Microsoft Accessibility Checker, which I'll show you now. Have meaningful URL links, which means don't put the HTTP full link um, into a digital document. Put an actual linkable piece of text that says what you're linking to. So it might be the UCD website, and that's what I'll make the link rather than putting in the, the HTTP. Um, if you're creating videos, this is really important to make sure that you have edited captions on the videos, especially if you're procuring videos for your service. Make sure that that's in from the beginning that you're going to expect captions um, to make those videos accessible for everybody. If you have an event, look at getting live captioning and providing reasonable accommodations for those who are attending. And again, that's just a question on your registration to ask if anybody needs anything additional to make sure that they can access your event. The Microsoft Accessibility Checker is the quickest and easiest tool you could ever use, and it will um, instantly improve the access of the materials that you, accessibility of the materials that you create. Um, and you simply go to file, check for issues, check accessibility, and it will walk you through everything that you need to do, whether that's alternative text, whether it's your heading styles, um, all of that. And it's really, really useful. So use it on PowerPoint, use it in Word. Um, and straight away, you'll have your plus one in terms of how you're going to make your materials more accessible for the future. So I'm out of time. So the last thing I just wanted to say is we have lots of resources on the University for All resource hub, um, which is just ucd.ie forward slash university for all. And there's some really useful resources as well on the AHEAD website. So they have an assistive technology hive if you're interested in seeing the types of uh, software that people might use to access information in a library. Um, then the AT Hive in ahead will help you with that. And there's also some really useful UDL for FET uh, resources as well that you might be interested in. But obviously, I'll share my slides as well. So thanks very much. <laughs>